Welcome to Distinctive Christianity Podcast, where we compare Mormon and creedal Christian thought. It is my honor to have today with us Aaron Shafawalif. Uh, we will link to his YouTube channel below. He's also associated with the Mormonism Research Ministry. And um, today we're going to be discussing the question, is God our literal father? Aaron, thank you so much. Skyler Hamilton, right? Yes. So... Distinctive Christianity, how long has that been going? Um, since January of last year. Cool. I look, took a look and there's pretty neat interviews there. That's, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. That's, that's the goal and this will uh, <laughs> We're both, We both go to local churches in the Salt Lake Valley. Yep. And you're a brother. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, you've been at this longer... Almost two decades. Longer than I yeah. have, for sure. Um, this question, is God our literal father? You love to start answering this question by focusing on the Book of Mormon's incarnational sonship. Will you uh, take the listener through this and why it matters in terms of framing the question in Mormon uh, evangelical dialogues? Yeah, there was a Sunstone talk that I really enjoyed. Um, It might have been 2006, but it keyed off of um, Ethan Smith's book, I think it's called The Character of Christ. It might have been like 1819 or something like that. <clears throat> but um, the Sunstone author notes that Ethan Smith took a view called incarnational sonship and spoke of the pre-incarnate Christ as the Son according to the flesh in kind of anticipatory language, like what's to come. It's proleptic. It's prolepsis. The idea is that the Son is Son in virtue of having taken on flesh. Why is He called the Son? He's incarnate. So it's called incarnational sonship. The idea is that He wasn't the Son. He might have existed in some, in, the, in, a, in a sort of bare Trinitarian, this is a very dangerous form of Trinitarianism, but in a bare Trinitarian um, theology which doesn't affirm the sonship of the Son prior to incarnation. It's actually what William Lane Craig argues oh uh, it's it's a very it's a dangerous social model of the trinity for him at least but in this view it's the taking on of a human nature the assumption of human nature that makes him this it sort of activates the metaphor of sonship and ethan smith is taking that sort of view and any sort of affirmation of the son as the son prior to his incarnation is via prolepsis So this is in contrast with the Christian view of eternal sonship. Eternal sonship holds that the Son was always the Son, not by mere mere foreknowledge and not by mere incarnational, um, incarnate status, but rather is eternally begotten of the Father. The idea is that the Son was was begotten before all worlds. This is the view of of, um, uh, I think it's Clement of Alexandria, Origen, and then Alexander Alexander of Alexandria, Athanasius, and then the Cappadocian Fathers, and Augustine, and uh, so Nicene, Christianity, the Athanasian Creed, so-called, affirms it, the Chalcedonian definition affirms it, medieval Christianity affirms it, Uh, those in the Protestant Reformation affirmed it, especially the Reformed scholastics, uh, the early evangelicals um, in America, uh, before they were called evangelicals maybe, uh, the the Christians in America affirmed it. But it started to suffer in the social Trinitarian uh, cognitive environment of American Christianity, as I understand it. And so it really took a beating in the 20th century in American evangelicalism and required retrieval. So, I mean... Rewind to the 19th century, it looks like Joseph Smith is actually taking a position on this Mm -hmm. in the Book of Mormon by arguing that the Son is called the Son because he took on flesh, uh, after the manner of the flesh. And you'll see this in the lectures on faith, too. Mm -hmm. Why is the Father called the Father? Tabernacle of Spirit. Yeah, the Father is a tabernacle of Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Son is a personage. It's interesting. Oh. Personage. Yeah, it's really interesting. Sorry, sorry, Ron yes. Huggins picks up on the personage right. usage. It's not person, but personage. And he puts that in a constellation of other evidences, arguing for what's called 
expansionistic modalism, the idea that in the Book of Mormon you have the Father and the Father becomes the Son, uh, expanding via incarnation um, to, to be the Father and the Son. So the, in, the, in the Book of Mormon, especially the 1830 version, Jesus says, I am the Father and the Son. So in any case, in any case before you get to late Joseph Smith stuff, you have the Book of Mormon teaching that the Son is incarnationally the Son, not the eternal Son in the sense of being eternally begotten of the Father. And I would argue, this is my big thesis, is that this was sort of an early evidence of Joseph Smith's allergy to, meta, uh, to Christian metaphysics and Christian transcendence. So it, it's sort of like a, an early evidence that this is going in a bad direction. He's, he's gutting uh, Trinitarianism of its transcendent um, substance. Um, and he's, he even says in the lectures on faith, well, he doesn't, I don't know if he writes this, but he, he approves this, the idea that, the, that God himself has faith. <laughs> so God has faith. Um, there's no eternal begetting of the Son. The Son becomes the Son by taking on the flesh. And this really, is, to me, sets the stage. It, it creates a vacuum because ultimately Smith goes on to believe that there's some principle of eternal progenitorship, that there has always been not just a progenitor, but the act of begetting. There has always been uh, something to that effect. Christianity has a principle of eternal progenitorship in that the Father eternally begets the Son. People may ask, what, is, what does it mean that the Son is eternally begotten? It means that the undivided substance of the Son is from and of the Father in such a manner that neither adds nor removes or changes uh, the being of God, and that the Son is of the same substance and nature of the Father, and yet a distinct person. In fact, the manner, the, the way that we distinguish the Son from the Father is relative personal properties. That the Son, like what makes the Son the Son and not the Father? Well, He's begotten. What makes the Father the Father, not the Son? Well, He begets the Son. We're not distinguishing the persons by centers of consciousness, like William Lane Craig does with social Trinitarianism. Um, yeah, side note, I, I think I'm, I'm mortified by his statement on his Reasonable Faith website that uh, he, he completely rejects eternal, eternal, Nicene eternal generation. He doesn't really have a problem with rejecting Chalcedonian categories or Athanasian categories or divine simplicity. He rejects eternal generation and he rejects the eternal sonship of the sun. It was very, 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 very dangerous. Anyway, but Joseph Smith is not <laughs> in the same category as William Lane Craig, but Joseph Smith is rejecting uh, eternal sonship, and eventually he fills out the empty vacuum um, of eternal progenitorship with uh, the Sermon in the Grove, which we can get to later. Right, and it seems like that is the transition from Book of Mormon to Nauvoo period theology is... In the Book of Mormon, this is still something unique of the Son. By King Follett, Sermon in the Grove, it becomes something true of everyone, at least yes. potentially. Yeah. So he democratizes this point into everybody, just at different levels of uh, yeah. progression. And We're in the lineage. Exactly. And so with, um, with this question of eternal progenitorship, Help, help the listener understand the various debates that this brings up in Mormon history, the, the different camps of Ooh. how we become who we are now. Of course, contingent upon obedience on our way toward Godhood. Map this out for the listener, and then I would love to see toward the end you interact with, with these different views. It looks like... <clears throat> The um, contemporaries of Joseph Smith shortly before his death and then immediately after, it looks like they're wrestling with a few teachings of Joseph Smith, some early, some later. Namely, that everything was created spiritually prior to natural creation. Now, it's really important to note that when Joseph Smith taught that, he taught that all things were... He's not... He's not uh, Teaching this, oh, there's like an echo in the room. I keep, <laughs> uh, he's not saying this in a particular way that I can tell of humanity. He's saying this of everything. So this applies to mosquitoes and vegetables, and this gets weird with Dorsen Pratt and everybody, but 
Um, he argues that everything is spiritually created before being naturally created. And there's some sort of formal link. Uh, there's a form and then sort of a, a concrete, things are made concrete or actual or real later. Um, I think this is in Blake Osler's article on preexistence. He notes that it's probably the case that these early writings in Mormonism are not referring to a concrete or real preexistence. They're referring to a conceptual or ideal preexistence. This is to say something is in the mind of God. So this is mind dependent. It's very different from Mormonism later, which goes on to teach that we pre-exist, coexist eternally alongside God, independently of his thoughts, that we would exist even if he didn't think of us, that our, we, that our existence is not dependent on the very thoughts of God, but that we are self-existent. I heard someone say, maybe it was you, in this, we were kind of like little I ams. Yep. That's <clears throat> literally how it was taught to me too. That's really? <laughs> yeah. By one. <laughs> well, Smith, you know, the principle of self-existence. Yep. It, it, so there's this, there's this idea of, of spiritual pre-creation, mm -hmm. initially conceptual and ideal and mind-dependent, but evolves to be mind-independent and concrete and real. Secondly, there's some sense in which man is eternal, right? So you, it, this could be an extension of ideal or conceptual creation where the, it's eternally in the mind of God. But Smith is concretizing this to say that in a more real and actual way, we're all co-eternal with God, not just in his mind. We're, we're alongside God in, in, the, in the great machine, in the cosmos, I'm borrowing later terms, the great mm -hmm. machine yeah. um, in the cosmos, that we're sort of along, we're alongside God. We're, he's self-existent, we're self-existent. So anyway, that we're, there's a spiritual pre-creation. So it's, it's like saying, part of man is spiritually created and part of man is eternal. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, finally, there's a principle of Joseph Smith that we get. I, some of his contemporaries prior to his death He's Eliza R. Smith. I say Eliza R. Snow. 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 She writes that uh, hymn later in 1845, but and it's based on earlier, um, the, an earlier reception. There are people that prior to Smith's death, at least construed what he was teaching as that of spirit birth, something like that along those lines. And in DNC 132, the famous polygamy section, Joseph Smith speaks of exalted gods who participate in the continuation of, of the seeds. Continuation of seeds, is that how you put it? So there's some sort of progenitorship, there's some sort of eternality, and there's some sort of creation. And the contemporaries of Smith are synthesizing this early on. And the way they do that early on is that, um, that of spirit birth. So uh, Van Hale argues, well, well, maybe the continuation of seeds isn't referring to spirit birth. It just means exalted gods have physical children. And Van Hale, this is a, a really prominent Mormon apologist in the 1980s. He's been running a radio show called is it Mormon Miscellaneous. It's been going on for 50 years, I think. Wow. Um, poor guy had a stroke, I think, a couple of years ago. But um, he argues against spirit birth, and he argues that maybe this is referring to like Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother coming to Eden and begetting the first bodies of Adam and Eve. So it's like, it's like Adam God, but it's not. It's, it, it's God, Adam isn't God, but Adam is begotten by, his body is begotten in Eden. Mm -hmm. That's his way of, yeah. he's very unique. He, he admits it as essay, Van Hill, in Line Upon Line. He doesn't know anybody that takes this, <laughs> this view. I appreciate Mormon apologists who, who are overt about that. Right. So it's Adam God, but pushed back a generation. Right. Just in right. case the listener didn't catch that. So shortly after Smith, um, you have Orson Pratt, Parley P. Pratt. Par Please interrupt me anytime. You, you, I might be venturing into territory that you, you better understand than I do. Parley P. Pratt, Orson Pratt, Brigham Young. Brigham Young argues, essentially, that spirit birth constitutes the beginning or the genesis of the individual. Now, one of the big issues here is that Smith is using different terms like intelligence, mind, soul, and spirit. And Smith himself uses them interchangeably simply to refer to an individual as co-eternal with God. Um, but in, intelligence is also used elsewhere to refer to the light of truth. 
Brigham Young goes on to treat intelligence as spirit element, but it's not personal spirit element. It's not like self-organizing. Um, it's not like self-directed. It's not like little tiny uh, atomistic self-aware, you know, particles. For him, it's impersonal stuff um, from which spirit birth would yield be the right verb, uh, a genuinely new person. So this is the, I call it the young model. Um, you go from having, I've heard one Latter-day Saint and in the Thoughtful Saints thread, it, that makes it sound like we were fuzzy <laughs> before we existed. It, it's this kind of like impersonal fuzziness where there is no self, there is no individual, there's no ego, there is no mind, there is no you. There's just this stuff of intelligence. And from that, um, Heavenly Father and one of his wives, Smith, uh, Young is very clear that this is a polygamous affair. Um, uh, 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 Heavenly Father and one of his wives beget a genuinely new person. Um, I don't know if Parley takes this view, um, but Orson takes this view with the tweak that the stuff of intelligence consists of particles that are self-aware. They're self-directed, they're self, and they have their own form of consciousness. An agency. Mm -hmm. Some sort of free will. And in my own terms, it looks like the begetting event. Um, there's a there's a kind of like like eggshell rhetorical dance here, uh, where Protestants like me just say something overt um, when you get when you talk about this. Latter Day Saint, I think uh, history has sort of trafficked in subtlety on this <laughs> issue, it, it, but it's like it's language that's suggestive of. Celestial copulation, celestial mm -hmm. coitus, celestial... You have two gendered sexual beings with resurrected human bodies with the full body parts of, of humanity uh, that are reproductive who are in some bodily union or in some sort of union. I'll say sexual because it requires a man and a woman are begetting a new spirit baby. And some Mormons are like, well, that doesn't necessarily mean fill in the blank. So it's something at least analogous to or suggestive of celestial coitus or celestial um, uh, copulation. Mm -hmm. And I've heard Latter-day Saints will say, well, maybe I, maybe it's like celestial in vitro fertilization. Okay, if y'all want to come up with other categories for that, that's fine. But the big point here is that um, in Young's view, there's a genuinely new individual begotten by parents um, from the stuff of intelligence. He's using the word intelligence in a way that's different from B.H. Roberts and arguably different from Joseph Smith. I'll take a breath there. Yeah, well, and just so people don't miss it, it's you have to be exalted married in order to give birth to these spirits, yeah. whatever you mean by give it's birth. It's a marital activity. Exactly, and that's, that's why the, the language is often at the very least suggestive yeah. uh, of sexuality, um, even if there's mystery room for speculation as to what that looks like, what the mechanics are, um, there's no escaping that this is how it's been talked about for a very long time. Yeah, an apologist last night is saying, well, you're saying we have to know exactly what the mechanics are like. No. I'm like I'm, that's not even my point. I'm just making the observation that your own leaders have, been, have used suggestive language Thus, thus, they're children, and they need it to yeah. say we're all children. <laughs> yeah. Right. Now, Brigham Young, mid-1850s, you know, as he is teaching this framework, it's an atom-god framework. Yes. So he's, he's humanizing this to the nth degree. And in this view, um, you know, it, he answers the question, where did the body of Adam come from mm -hmm. with Adam is... God. You, you call it Mike, uh, Michael God. Michael God. Maybe be a little more precise. Mm -hmm. Adam being a role for a season Michael in, being the in person. each of these worlds. Right. But really who he is is Michael, the archangel. Michael mm -hmm. is the father. The father of both the spirits and bodies. Yeah, in this view, the Holy Spirit, I hate saying this out loud. It's so blasphemous. I, I, I don't want to geek out on this stuff as though it's just interesting or just weird. It's 
To be clear, it's extremely irreverent, irreverent theology. It's impious. I, I would say it's heartless. It's indifferent. It's, um, it lacks the Holy Spirit. It doesn't have the same Christian intuitions. It doesn't revere the Bible. It doesn't revere Christian history. It doesn't revere the body of Christ. It's, it's grossly blasphemous. So I'll just say that up front. But in, in this framework, it's the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary to prepare her body for the bodily condescension of God. I mean, so in Brigham's view, the same one, Adam is the same one who impregnated Mary. Yeah. Um, and that happens by the Holy Spirit overshadowing her and preparing her for this marital act, um, the, the condescension of God to marry herself. Anyway, so I mean, he's, he, he's thinking in very literal, humanistic terms. You've used the, the statement, Romans 1 is a... Blueprint. <laughs> Blueprint for Mormon theology. Yeah. And the, the point there is that um, in Christian theology and in Paul's theology, God is the archetype or the ectype. Yep. We're made in his image. He's not made in our image. Right. And when we reverse that, we start domesticating God, humanizing God mm -hmm. in the other direction. And, and Brigham's doing that like at breakneck speed. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, just on the Holy Spirit point, just so people don't lose this, Brigham Young explicitly mocks the idea that the Holy Ghost was involved in the conception of Jesus, saying, if that's true, every time you give a priesthood blessing, brethren, be careful lest you impregnate all these women. Mm -hmm. um, he's saying there's one way to have a child, and we all know what way that is. Therefore, the father came down to another one of his wives, mm -hmm. you know, Eve being... Mary being... Right, right another who may be part of it, the daughter generation, but Ugh. married, which, I mean, you can see hints of how they were themselves living in polygamy. Yeah, here. I was talking to a friend. Sorry yeah. to cut you off. No, uh, no, please. My friend Rick, I was explaining some of this to Rick, and he goes, this is over-sexualizing everything. It's even sexualizing not just man, but God. Mm -hmm. And he, I wasn't even talking about polygamy when he said that, but it struck me. I was like, oh, this theology is birthed out of the cognitive and sexual environment of polygamy. Yeah, yeah, and you can see its fingerprints everywhere, um, even if you're trying to avoid it. So you, you spend a lot of time, and this was the model that I was most familiar with in the B.H. Roberts synthesis. For those who don't know, B.H. Roberts is consistently ranked the best LDS general authority thinker in, in at least the LDS Mormon history. Um, what is the Roberts synthesis? Mm -hmm. in, and will you kind of describe um, how this is typically what you interact with? So rewinding just a little bit, Pratt's please, view please. is not, there's not a lot of favor bestowed no. upon Pratt's view. Is the seer in large part is condemned. Um, there's an 1860 and 1865 statement put out by the first presidency statements um, condemning Pratt's framework, they really didn't, I, I think Pratt's view even suggested that there was a time when there was no God and the first God was self-organized and that um, all the gods are equal in knowledge and Young didn't like that at all. So he made it very clear in his first presidency statement that um, some gods know more than others. Mm -hmm. And essentially... And that they're continuing to learn. Yeah. They don't, they're not damned in a, in a cessation of progression. Mm -hmm. Um, they continue to grow in knowledge and power. So uh, Young condemns Pratt's view, and Young's view seems to carry the day uh, for 40, 50 years, is that I can tell. Um, and this is picked up by Charles Penrose um, in the 1880s, I think. Forgive me if I'm imprecise. So uh, what happens, though, I think I've seen this with I think it might be Thomas G. Alexander. He calls it the recon. I think I think he calls it the reconstruction era of Mormon theology. Yeah, Mormonism in transition. It's a fantastic book. Mm. Uh, maybe that's the a phrase in the yeah in uh, yeah. Okay, so there are a number of LDS philosophers. And it, side note here, it's interesting how much of an impact they have on the Mormon leadership. There is Nelson <coughs> Nelson. Uh, I know, like Hergus Wilson's a philosopher. Do you know yep. what outlines N of Nels Mormon Nelson philosophy. is? He yeah, he he taught more than that, but yes. Okay, so there's Nels Nelson, like Hergus Wilson, mm -hmm. and then B. H. Roberts. B. H. Roberts is revisiting the sermons of Joseph Smith. So 
So he's swimming in this literature and he realizes, uh-oh, Joseph Smith taught that man, his innermost self, is eternal and therefore not begotten into existence. So what B.H. Roberts suddenly tries to do is synthesize the teaching, the, at least more clearly explicated by Jung, that we are spirit, that we are, that there's spirit birth. It might be better called spirit begetting. Uh, yep. The birthing is, so. a, is a result of the begetting. Mm -hmm. and, and for Jung and Pratt, this involves spiritual pregnancy. So there's, there's begetting, gestation, and pregnancy, and rearing up. So in the B.H. Roberts view, he tries to synthesize the eternality, the eternality of the individual, not just the stuff from which someone is begotten. He tries to affirm the individual, the eternal, it's called eternal personalism by, I think, Blake Osler. Um, he tries to affirm that we never, as individuals, never had a beginning, and yet still were begotten in premortality. So in his view, you did not have your genesis at spirit begetting or birth. Rather, you were then clothed or expanded, in my words, upgraded. You went from being a, an intelligence, so he's using the word intelligence more like Joseph Smith in that we are uh, self-existent individuals who already existed, that the me was always me, that the, that the I am was always the I am in, in, the, in the human person, um, and that in spirit begetting or birth, the individual becomes, and the language is sort of being shifted here. Um, Mormons kind of develop more systematic definitions around soul. Um, so in this view, you have a spirit body. You might think of this like Russian dolls, where you have the innermost piece, which is then encapsulated by another. Um, I, a hand in the glove analogy is used by some modern all, all Latter day time. Saints. All the time. Though you have to take it a step further to include the intelligence, but yes, this is what I was taught. That same concept of the clothing. Yep. And it's really interesting because in Christian theology, we, we really want to, want to be clear that the body is not like a spacesuit. It's not no. like, it's not really like clothing. It's an integral part of the original self. Mm -hmm. But in this view, you, you existed for an eternal amount of time as a disembodied intelligence self. Mm -hmm. Peter Carmack qualifies the intelligence um, term as intelligence self. And what he's doing is he's trying to make sure he's not equivocating because intelligence can be referred to as intelligence as the as a pure light of, in, of knowledge or something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. I forget the exact phrase. It can be, it can refer to a kind of spirit element or it can refer to a person or an, an individual, an ego, a mind. A self. So he, re he refers to it as intelligence self. And that's really helpful because it, it's, it's uh, avoiding the equivocation that we struggle with with LDS dialogue in history. So this intelligence self, if I could backdate that, if I could retrofit that term, intelligence in, 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 in B.H. Roberts' model is clothed or expanded with the spirit body. And that satisfies the eternality that satisfies the spirit birth element, and it satisfies some sense of creation or re re rearrangement. Now, though John Witso, help me out, John Witso, what's his position? I forget the... I mean, he was Corman the Twelve. Okay. And so... by the, just to be clear too, B.H. Roberts was a general authority. He was a president of the 70, and at the time they were seen in higher regard than the 70 is now. So he would have been mm -hmm. seen as apostolic in some way. In last night in the debate, um, just yeah, just so the listener knows, B. H. Roberts is a big deal. He was sort of dismissive of Roberts, but which he, was silly, right? And they looked to Roberts as an intellectual oh, he's, giant he, at and, the time. It, it, now, yeah, I mean, I think people in the know, I think he regularly ranks number one in these um, uh, votes. Um, sometimes, sometimes they include Mormon PhDs. Sometimes just great Mormon thinkers. Who are the great Mormon thinkers? He regularly ranks one. Orson Pratt regularly ranks. When I think about the uh, Reconstruction era, I think about yeah. um, Talmadge, Roberts, Witso, and Penrose. Yeah, uh, I think those are the four. That so Roberts, um, he Witso uh, takes up this view, um, but there's opposition mm -hmm. from the first presidency, especially Charles Penrose mm -hmm. and Anton Lund. 
-hmm. who have inherited the young view. And they, they don't like uh, what Roberts is teaching about this. And so there's some, there's some significant opposition that has bearing on things that are published at the time. But it still makes its way into published material and it's picked up by Witso, and it really be it becomes uh, the assumed and dominant view in Latter Day Saint culture, mid to late twentieth yep. century. I was telling you, I never heard any other view. Mm. So I think, you know, especially if you're a Christian listening, this is the view you're more likely to interact with, mm. not the young view. Not the dominant view, as you said. Yeah, I met an apologist yeah. last night. I think it was, his name was Josh. And I, I tried to press him on the... I say apologist. He's sort of like a social media apologist. Uh, and that's not denigration. It's just he's not like a published or, or widely known apologist. But he's apologetics-minded. And he didn't realize he took the young view. And so I was trying to help him understand the difference between... He had the young view, but the dominant staple default view is the Roberts view. Jonathan Stapley... In LDS, um, I think he's an author. He calls this view the Roberts view. He calls it uh, tripartite existentialism. Tripartite existentialism, not to be confused with. Forgive me for being pedantic. Uh, the trichotomous view in Christian discussion. Sure. There's the dichotomous view of the material and immaterial self, or the tr trichotomous view of the self, which is body, soul, and spirit, with further distinctions. Um. So anyway, uh, can we pause on that really please, quick? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because um, our, the regular listener, I've consistently referred to it as trichotomy to try to help them get intelligent spirit body. Will you flesh out why you don't so they can hear why you, you call it something else? Um, so like even in our interview with um, Kim Riddlebarger, I introduced this view, although I did define it intelligent spirit body. Um, as trichotomy, correct me, uh, so, so the listener can hear. Well, it might why. not be a correction. I, there might be there might be LDS authors that use the term trichotomy. I haven't seen it, but in the LDS discussion, this is very niche, by the way. <laughs> this isn't like a huge discussion, but um, uh, with this term anyway, tripartite. Um, I don't know. It just I don't have a good answer. It, trichotomous uh, for me is more associated with the body-soul-spirit discussion. Tripartite refers more to intelligence, spirit, uh, body-enclosed self, and then mortal body-enclosed mm -hmm. self. Yeah. Whereas uh, body-soul-and-spirit, these are terms that are used in the New Testament that arguably, I think it's, I forget if it's 1st or 2nd Thessalonians, the dichotomist view notes that Paul uses them interchangeably, uh, right. soul and spirit. He, right. He's not he's not intending to give us a systematic distinction. Update our anthropology or something like yeah. that. No, I, I wanted the listener to hear because I'm going to start making that distinction to avoid um, what I, I typically try to do is try to distinguish the Christian and Mormon yeah. terminology for clarity. And you've helped me here that I should probably start doing that here. So I just want the listener to hear that. I think it's essential to understanding their view, though. And the power of the Roberts view, um, I'd love your thoughts on this, is that it is taking not just the young view, but it's trying, once again, that's what a synthesis is, of course, but it's trying to hold together most of what came before yeah, um, as best as possible. Whereas these other threads are denying parts of what came before. So I think the Roberts view is powerful in terms of authority as well, because he doesn't have to explicitly say Young was wrong. He can just say yeah. there's more to it, right? Yeah. Maybe it's not historically responsible, <laughs> but. Yeah, it's really interesting how these different views have the increase or decrease of currency, but it's done with subtlety. Sure. And not naming names. Or, um, so in the Christian tradition, there was a developed systematic set of categories, historical theology, a tracing of the development of things. And we're more overt about these things. It's not embarrassing to us. It just helps us think more clearly. It helps mature the church's unity and thinking and theology and uh, devotion. In Mormonism, I think that they struggle 
with superimposing individual views on the whole church. So you'll you'll get you'll get things like, well, that's not official doctrine. That's just speculation. But when an apologetics minded Latter day Saint wants to express what they think is the official position, it's interesting they'll say, We believe right? So they'll they'll use the language of like common Catholicity, common confession, uh, and it sort of implies that it's widely taught and widely believed and widely confessed. But sometimes all that we believe means in the apologetic discourse is this was originally taught and it's what we should believe today, even though it's not taught or believed in some cases. Like, so we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But um, so, I mean, I'd say this because why are we even talking about the history of these views? I think it's important because it helps me understand Latter-day Saints, who they have been, helps, me, helps inform who they are today. What they believe today is informed by what they used to believe. Um, when I'm talking to individual Latter-day Saints, even if I'm not using these terms with them, it helps me calibrate and triangulate. It helps me understand where they're at in the stream. Because Mormonism is not monolithic. Uh, it's, helpful to make, it's helpful to have discussions about uh, what the Bible says and what Christian history says and what the Christian church says relative to a particular view that Latter-day Saints are taking, even if it's unconsciously. They're, they're very, uh, they're not, I'm trying to help increase the self-awareness that Latter-day Saints um, have different views. They, they, mm-hmm. they're not monolithic. They're not, you know, no. these, I, I, think, I think I took this on a wandering path. No, 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 that, no, yeah. it's good. And I, I just think um, that on, the diversity only increases as you include more Mormons. Right. Yeah. Uh, we we interviewed uh, earlier this year Kyle Bashirs about mm. the Strangites. He did incredible work. You know, one of the most knowledgeable people in the world on this group, and they they have they're monotheistic, but they have a view of Jesus as a do- adopted. They have an explicitly adoptionist Christology, mm. and you think, I guess, I mean, it's no different than the word games LDS have to do with the Book of Mormon, but in in terms of the pattern of distortion. But I mean, that's that's I, I never run into that with LDS. I mean, so it's yeah, Mormonism is a very diverse phenomenon. So you have to kind of get down to what impulses the universalist impulse. Um, the analogy Romans one is a blueprint instead of being condemned. This is something they have in common. You, you almost can't say this view is it, but you can kind of see their orientation mm. as similar. It's a spirit, know? yeah, there's a common spirit, a common set of. You said impulses or intuitions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that, that Robert's view carries the day, or at least it, you know, it becomes a, an, a presumed view in the mid to late 20th century. And you have statements like the 1909 Origin of Man statement, mm-hmm. which is really drawn from Orson F. Whitney's writings. But The it, listener will know that name. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> uh, I'm kind of on a mission to help Latter-day Saints understand, to read their own stuff, to like get to know their own... Um, Mm -hmm. historic teachings, but the 1909 origin of man's statement affirms essentially spirit birth. I think it uses begetting birth and rearing. So it uses like three different subcategories of of this spirit birth uh, idea. And then there's the 19, is it 15 or 16 for his presidency statement on the father and the son. I think James Talmadge is the main guy behind that. And that has a section in it on God as a literal father. And if I remember it correctly, it's affirming conceptually some form of spirit birth. So today we have a statement, which is the 1995 Proclamation on the Family, which affirms, I think it's the language is of us being sons of heavenly parents. I'm not sure if it uses the word literal or not. Um, I forget. But anyway, there is the, uh, there is a view Today, there's a four, so I've gone through three views: is the young, the young view, the Pratt view, the Roberts view, and then the final major view is um, an Osler, Oslerian view, that of or, uh, Blake Osler. Um, he didn't necessarily begin it, but he's the most prominent proponent of it. Osler notes correctly that Joseph Smith uses intelligence, spirit, soul, mind synonymously, and doesn't explicate spirit birth. And Osler doesn't think that we can trust the immediate contemporaries of Smith who are inferring spirit birth. 
he thinks they've, they're going, they're taking this in a direction Smith wasn't intending to take it. Um, I think it's Brian D. Hales wrote a, pa a paper on the continuation of seeds, ar arguing for spirit birth being the trajectory of, maybe, I think maybe, maybe Terrell Gibbons did this too, but at least arguing for that spirit birth being the trajectory of Smith's teaching. Uh, Osler argues, Blake, Os Blake, Blake T. Osler argues that this was neither the teaching nor the trajectory of Osler's, of uh, Joseph Smith's view. And that this notion that um, we had a beginning at spirit birth or that there was a heavenly mother who's literally spiritually uh, begetting uh, is not according to his own teachings. So he argues that in premortality we were adopted. Now, um, some others have taken up this view, notably Peter Carmack of BYU-Idaho. He wrote a two-volume set of books on, I think it's called What is Mormon, uh, uh, it's like something like What is Mormon Theology or something like that. Um, and he has a developed argument for rejecting spirit birth. And it's, uh, I'll come back to him in a second, but there's also, I think it's Samuel M. Brown wrote a paper on adoption where he, he opposes, I think he opposes the spirit birth view. In any case, back to P Peter Carmack. So there, there have a number of arguments against spirit birth. Uh, one is that Smith never taught it. Two, it's not uh, either explicitly taught, nor is it necessarily contained or required or inferred from Scripture. Um, three, oh, I shouldn't even enumerate these, but that um, there's, a, there's a, a weirdness, a strangeness to this idea that's unwanted where you have exalted, embodied, resurrected beings who use whatever verb you want, that's something like beget, copulate, whatever, procreate, um, who are begetting, uh, lesser beings. Like they're like, what, like they're, you have these embodied immortal resurrected beings and they have a spirit baby. So Carmack notes that this is an odd sort of down, like a, you would expect something uh, more than that if they were to beget. He also argues that this presents a logistical problem. I kid you not. Um, I think it was like 2012. I'm thinking about this. And I think it's Pratt who argues that spirit birth entails a nine-month gestation period. Maybe he suggests it or something like that. So I was thinking about the cumulative population of Earth. And there's liberal and conservative estimates. I think it's anywhere from 50 to 100, roughly, cumulatively billion uh, people on earth and then you have worlds without number and then you have uh, the one third who rebelled in pre-mortality um, and then you have infant mortality um, that aren't counted in the 50 to 100 billion uh, or maybe they would, wouldn't count those I don't know if Latter-day Saints would count that number in this equation But so if God has one wife I made, I made a spreadsheet and it's like if, if it's if, if gestation is singular to one spirit baby and it's one at a, it's sequential, it's one at a time and it requires nine months and there's only one goddess, how much time would it take to beget the cumulative population of just earth, not including uh, earth plus the one third re rebellious premortal spirits, not to include the worlds without number under heavenly father's jurisdiction in this model. And so I just have a spreadsheet that tweaks, you, you can tweak the number of wives that God has. You can tweak the gestation period. Um, I mean, you could improve this to improve. I, I, I'm, I know this is like crazy, but just hear me out. You, can, you could say, well, maybe he, she always has twins or triplets, whatever. You can increase the simultaneous gestation. So I thought, I was just thinking this, like, this is like, this, if, if, if Mormons are trying to humanize, domesticate, materialize, temporalize this kind of thing. They are going to have a logistical problem where heavenly, I mean, there's this, I, 
Are we going to become heavenly uh, parents? And are we going to be busy begetting billions of spirit babies through an analogous process to human procreation? Um, and are our wives, our exalted wives, going to be birthing babies sequentially for billions of years? Um, so I did the spreadsheet and I share it with a few friends just thinking about the logistical problem. Well, so I come across Peter Carmack, a BYU, Idaho, I think he's an associate professor. And he uh, writes these books and he has an argument against spirit birth in part because of log the logistical problem. Interesting. And he makes the same argument that this would require an incredible amount of time to beget spirit babies. And polygamy doesn't really solve the problem. It just sort of mitigates the. It kind of cuts it in half with division, but it doesn't really solve the problem. So uh, you'll see it's either Brent Top or Roger Terry, uh, other LDS, one of those two addresses the logistical problem. And um, so some Latter-day Saints are like, well, maybe this can be resolved through the multiverse. Uh, maybe there is a simultaneous process of gestating, birthing, begetting through multiple wives, or, you know, maybe this is done, you know, simultaneously through a multiverse sort of equation. <sighs> okay, so there, Carmack's arguing against spirit birth, and he argues, what if we just instead posit that God takes this, by the way, either an infinite pool or a finite pool of intelligences, he takes a large subset of them, billions of them, and he has some sort of covenant event where they opt into being adopted children. And the reason why Carmack really likes this over and against the young view is that the young view, in, according to Carmack, um, it violates free agency. Because if you're birthed into existence through spirit birth, you didn't have an option. And it, 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 it takes away the theodicy solutions that Mormons are really excited about through the Roberts and Osler view. And it's okay, so it's like, well, maybe um, Carmack posits that there's a mass adoption covenant event where billions of people are opting into, via their free agency, being adopted into the family. Well, that's the fourth view. It, it, re it rejects the role of Heavenly Mother in spirit birth. It rejects spirit birth. It rejects the young view that you had your genesis at spirit birth or spirit begetting. And it, what's, I'll, I'll take a breath after this statement. It is breathtaking because these Latter-day Saint philosophers, we thank the O God for what? A evidently a philosopher, are saying that virtually every Latter-day Saint, prophet, or apostle that has spoken to this issue after Joseph Smith, you had it wrong. <laughs> maybe that's a slight overstatement. Maybe there's some people I don't know about. I'm not aware. I, maybe they're there. I don't know them. But, you know, but, but, but Osler is basically arguing that this rich, long tradition of Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles are just flat out wrong about spirit birth. But hey, great news. We have the philosopher Blake Osler <laughs> to rescue us. We thank the O God for a, if I could irreverently say this as a criticism, we thank the O God, this is a play on their song, we thank mm -hmm. the O God for a prophet. We thank the O God for LDS philosophers to correct the errors of Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles. Even if they're Elders Quorum's second counselor, um, apparently that's they're going to be right, and Orson Pratt, we don't care if he was an apostle, or Young, we don't care if he was an apostle, church president, yeah. or Smith, we don't care if he was the prophet of the Restoration. That's what I mean with the Robert synthesis. What, what I find, <clears throat> what I th I'm shocked that more of these guys don't find appealing to Roberts, that even if they update the view, it should be through a Roberts lens, is that though you have to make decisions at key points as to whether Young or Pratt are right. You ha it's, it's tough regardless. They're still both at the table. They're both still being accounted for in some way. You know, um, Even you, you, people might say the Roberts view is a de novo because Young and Pratt saw themselves as different. But still, he's affirming internal intelligence. 
he's affirming spirit birth. He's trying to hold all the pieces together. But it seems like in recent years, philosophers can come in and say, no, 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 I don't need any of it. I'm going back to the puzzle pieces and I'm going to make it my, make my own puzzle it's with a, no prophetic authority. It's an irreverent dismissal of LDS prophetic tradition. Absolutely. And it's, uh, I mean, frankly, it, uh, the point about agency is well taken. You said Carmack is his name? I think, yeah, I mean, you have to have some, that's why the Robert synthesis makes sense. You could be in uh, uncreated intelligence who mm -hmm. chooses, who participates at least in spirit birth. Um, but I, that point, his focus on agency, it's almost like a, a, an insight into the mentality that would dismiss based on his own agency, apparently the entire prophetic tradition. I should note that there's variations on the Osler view Sure. Some, not Osler himself, have taken it and gotten excited about the theological potential of incorporating same-sex marriage into yep. the afterlife. Yep. That's, I don't think, I'm not projecting that onto Osler himself. Yeah, but, I don't know what his view is. It's like a queer Mormon theology promising avenue, according to some Mormon mm -hmm. liberals, that maybe we can fit a non-procreative spiritual parent uh, mm -hmm. uh, concept in the afterlife that doesn't require a male-female right. couple. And that you choose your gender, maybe you could choose differently someday. Uh, I haven't, seen I don't that. think I've, I've studied seen that. that. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I've seen that up there. I haven't really deep dived on that one. Yeah. But, but you're right, it's creating spaces. Um, we don't want to over-psychologize people we don't know. That being said, um, you would think, given what the LDS missionaries all around the world are saying to people about the LDS church, and their distinctive truth claims, that the thinkers who are putting themselves out there as loyal to those truth claims mm -hmm. would actually show loyalty to the truth claims, and yet they don't. They're more loyal to a Margaret Barker. They're more loyal to a Blake Osler. This is a phenomenon we're all encountering, and it is, it's, it is one of the more frustrating elements of engaging in this space. It's not frustrating to me to see somebody assuming the Robert synthesis and struggling to account for the young view. I'm not criticizing that. That's hard. <laughs> Thus, that's what Roberts is trying to do. What I don't like is the way in which it's demissed. Orson Pratt, he's just an apostle. Well, who are you? Who is Blake Osler? I mean... A 21-year-old BYU student. Right. <laughs> you need... Who, who recently read a book he's excited about, he, who's rejecting the rich, long, prophetic tradition of his own religion. Right. If you, it, the, the, the entire claim of restored authority is up against Christian claims, reducing Christian claims of authority to speculation. We have authority. This is what gives us insight. This is our mode of operation. Submit to that is turned into a free-for-all where philosophers treat it like what? My request. Plato? my beseeching or imploring to the LDS apologetics community is, even if you're going to take like a Protestant liberal view of the fallibility of scripture and prophets, can we at least have a discussion about what the LDS historic views are? Can we at least categorize them? Can we at least put them on the table for consideration? Can we at least talk about them initially? Can we at least calibrate wherever we come to from, can we triangulate from these positions? Can we at least... Uh, have them as reference points. It, can they at least can can your own prophets at least be on our shoulders contributing to the discussion? Um, in in the in the Protestant community, there's a lot of talk right now of retrieval where it's really important to seek Catholicity with other believers, even historically, and so we aren't under the authority of the church tradition as though it's final, um, but we should at least be able to consult church tradition is a rich treasure chest of spirit indwelled believers who have been meditating on scripture longer than we have. So if we don't avail ourselves of the treasure chest, then we're not really respecting the fact that we're a part of the lowercase c Catholic tradition of spirit indwelled believers. Well, there's a, there's a version of that in Mormonism. If, 
if you have prophets and apostles, it seems like you should at least avail yourself of the treasure chest. Even if you're taking a, 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 a even if you take like a maximally fallible view of prophets and apostles, you should at least be consulting what they wrote on the subject that you're considering. Mm -hmm. And can we at least make that a part of the discussion with interfaith dialogue? Yeah, no, absolutely. And how is it disrespectful for Christian? Their claim is the one true church based on restored priesthood authority. And yet we quote their priesthood authorities more than they do. And often when we quote them, we're treated as though we're being disrespectful. This is a cultural problem with the LDS that they need to confront. They, why? It is not our job to make them more mature in dealing with criticism. Why do you feel so offended when I quote your leaders? Right. What's underneath that? What's the subterranean issue there? Right. To, it, your, it, to your point. It, right, right. So to, to wrap up this... Uh, doctrinal section. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to authority, but um, I really do want to get to the Christian side of the line. And, and Please. The range of <laughs> this is the setup for that. The, yeah. the range of debates and how, even yeah. though there's diversity on the Christian side as well, yeah. um, there's still a line between the Mormon diversity and the Christian diversity on the subject. But one thing that um, you said earlier, I, I'd love to come back to, um, I want to land on this eternal progenitorship question yeah. and have you flesh it out, even if it's repetition, just so people really get this. This is a great way to see the difference between the Mormon worldview and, and the Christian one. But when you said ideal creation, like DNC 93, mm -hmm. the way it uses intelligence is singular, and it seems to be in the mind of God that things yeah. are uh, have their ideal creation before they're created. Yeah. Um, Conceptual, right. ideal. And then that becomes... Um, atomized and democratized. I want to show this pattern um, from the Book of Mormon example we started with to intelligence, to kingdoms. You know, it's not heaven, hell. You get rid of hell and you, you pluralize the kingdoms. Mm. You pluralize within the celestial kingdom. There's a tendency of pluralizing mm. and atomizing and rooting in the individual what used to be unique of Jesus, even mm. if it was in a confused way. As an alternative to transcendence. Right. Interesting. Right. Where transcendence becomes more pantheistic, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, that, that, there might be a better term for that. So flesh out for those listening this eternal progenitorship point again in terms of the direction Smith takes it and the direction the Bible takes it. So in the Bible... It's really interesting. The Son is not this generic second person in the Trinity. Uh, if I could pick on um, uh, William Lane Craig again, William Lane Craig again uh, he seems to think that the order of Father, Son, and Spirit is arbitrary, and that uh, it's not. It wasn't. It didn't have. Having decided to send, it it wasn't. It didn't have to be that the Father sent the Son. The son could have sent the father. He doesn't seem. He doesn't see uh, a fittedness to the father sending the son because he doesn't really have a category for father and son prior to the prior to creation. Um, so it, it sort of genericizes the persons of the Trinity. Well, the reason why that's so shocking and so counter to Christian history is Christians have been looking at the Bible and in the Bible. Um, you have the word, which sort of it, that the word of God is called the word, um, doesn't really speak to what he is. It speaks to what's been happening for, from eternity. Um, he's, if I could say, he's been worded forth from the father, from all eternity. Um, Hebrews one says that of, of the son, he is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact representation of his nature. That radiating has been going on um, from all eternity. That imaging, uh, Colossians 1, he is the image of the invisible God. That's not merely re referring to incarnational imaging. He, he was, Christians reasoned, the image prior to creation. So he's been in some sense imaging uh, from all eternity. Um, Paul picks up, I think, on Proverbs 8, where wisdom is at God's side. He's the very wisdom and power of God. And then you have this uh, monogamous category, which in the 20th century, some uh, 
translations reduced to like one and only son. But there's a retrieval like Charles Lee Irons and others are sort of taking it back to only begotten son now. Anyway, it looks like the son in the bosom of the father has always been begotten of the father. It wasn't an event. It wasn't punctiliar. It wasn't chronological. It wasn't temporal. This is a transcendent, uh, atemporal uh, uh, begetting of the son. This is, and by the way, we're using language here that God has given us that's very gracious and accommodating, but it's speaking of something far greater. So it really, it really, it, it, it's, it, it forces us with the issue of incomprehensibility of what's called analogical categories, that, that the, the thoughts and uh, linguistic categories we've been given by God uh, map analogically to the transcendent reality, but are not a one-to-one -one univocal uh, exact correspondence. They're, it's not like we're comprehending by wrapping our heads around or emotionally fully internalizing or intellectually grasping the entirety of what, what's going on here. God condescends to give us analogical knowledge. Equivocal means nothing like, univocal means exactly like, analogical means it resembles but doesn't map exactly onto. So it's real and meaningful, but it's not comprehensive. So God, anyway, it forces this, this, this doctrine of eternal generation forces that that issue. Anyway, so it's, it's, it becomes a humility issue because you're like, oh, I don't know anything but what God tells me. And what he tells me is, is analogical. I, I'm a, it, it, it reminds you you're very creaturely. You're, you're just finite. Um, and, and, and it makes you feel more desperate for God to tell you about himself because you can't uh, reason your way up to him. Right. So he's the one God, the triune God, who created time and space. The creator creation distinction that informs every point of our understanding of, of God, including in the incarnation. And therefore, Jesus is not the Son in time at in, in any way. He didn't become the Son. At any point, because he's eternally the Son before there's even a point yeah. in existence. Right? It's that's what you mean by odd temporal, apart from space and time. Always a father, always a son. Um, if he became the son at any point. That would mean God became a father. Yeah. That would be a change in God. We and believe God does not change. The right? eternal progenitorship right. principle here is getting at this intuition or this biblical principle that there's always been a father. Yep. And there's always been a son. And the, the Christian answer to that, I, I, if, I, if I understand Christian history correctly, it's that this eternal generation doctrine, perhaps with Clement of Alexandria and Origen, it's the mature fruit of reflection upon the best of Logos Christology. Mm -hmm. It's not that in the second century they have a fully orbed uh, doctrine of Nicene eternal generation, but it's the, it's the mature fruit of, of sort of reasoning through these things and, and ref further reflecting upon scripture. Theologians call it, call it a eternal processions. Um, the father always begetting the son and the son always proceeding from the father and the son it's not that they're static persons, they're just generic persons, or they're just there. It's that there's a, there's a uh, oh, who is it? Bavi talks about, there's a, is it, uh, oh, it's, I, I, I tremble to think I'm horribly mispronouncing uh, this term. It's like a fecundity, like an internal fruitfulness. There's a generative life to God. That in the very being of God, there has been an eternal generative relationship. Mm -hmm. The Son has always been from and of the Father. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. Wow. So that, that there is a, an eternal progenitorship, but it's not a principle shared by all these beings. No. It's one being. It's the relational, it's the relation. Mm -hmm of the Father and the Son from all eternity. Uh, so what we get as humans is we get a little window into this through the incarnation of the Son, which is not equivalent to the eternal generation. It's a fitting, uh, it's, the incarnation is fitting and congruent with the beauty of the Father begetting the Son eternally. So the big idea here is that in Nicene Trinitarianism, which pausing for a second, I'm not convinced that 20th century evangelical countercult ministries had eternal generation on the radar much. 
because evangelicalism didn't. Wayne Grudem uh, had it off his radar, or at least he was non-committal or even dis uh, non non affirming of it for quite some time. Bruce Ware had trouble with this. Um, B.B. Warfield, there's a really good essay by Scott Swain about how B.B. Warfield sort of backed off of this, thinking it was too speculative, and he didn't realize, I don't think he realized maybe just how a lot of countercult apologetics, uh, for the better in many ways, was downstream from B.B. Warfield. And B.B. Warfield was not a full uh, endorser of, of this classic Nicene Trinitarian eternal generation. So I, I think that in the LDS evangelical dialogues, we actually missed out on eternal generation as being a part of this contrast. And I, I think that part of this discussion needs to be like, okay, let's just forget Mormonism for quite some time here and focus on uh, retrieval and cleaning up our own house and re reflecting on scripture again, on what this says. But what, I, what I'd like to say is that I would, I would submit for scrutiny in the LDS evangelical communities, that part of the Joseph Smith allergy to transcendence and Christian metaphysics in the Book of Mormon is found in this affirmation of incarnational sonship, that the son becomes the son by taking on flesh. And there's a, an implicit rejection there of eternal sonship via eternal begetting, the father eternally begetting the son so in Smith's earliest view, it looks like the father becomes the father and the son, that kind of thing. So I would argue that um, Smith rejects the Trinity, not merely eventually in affirming multiple beings in the Godhead. He, he more initially refer, he, he kind of, he kind of uh, puts the demolition charges on, under the bridge by first rejecting the eternal generation of the son. So he opts for incarnational sonship, which creates this vacuum, because there's still this uh, somewhat proper intuition that Scripture still seems to affirm an eternal father-son reality that is not merely proleptic, it's not merely anticipatory of incarnational sonship. So where Smith seems to take this in a sermon popularly called the uh, Sermon in the Grove. This is shortly after the uh, King Fault Discourse. It kind of picks back up where that left off. And he, it's, it's fascinating. He, he preaches on Revelation 1.6, which in the King James is awkward. It speaks of God and his and father. His father yeah. And modern translations, it's like his God and father, right? So Smith just, he doesn't understand enough Greek, <laughs> and he's just working with the awkwardness of the King James. He's also ignoring his own translation, quote-unquote. <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. to laugh at that, because <laughs> when in the Joseph Smith translation, he tries to smooth over Revelation 1-6 right. right. by removing the, the, the confusion. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the grand irony here is that this is one verse where he got it right. <laughs> He, he got Revelation 1-6, JST-inspired version, right. But in the Sermon in the Grove, I think this is like weeks before his death, um, he, he reverses. And he, instead of building his case on the JST, he builds his case again on the King James. And he argues, essentially, forgive me for the par paraphrase, uh, the father has a father, and he appeals to the progenitorship principle, but he... But he it's a different take. It's not that the father has always begotten the son. It's that where that it's essentially that every father is himself a son. And in this view, every son can become a father. So for him, there's an, there's, there's, there's always been fathering and all there has been sonship, but it's not because the father has always been the father. And it's not because the son has always been the son. It's because there's always been a father and there's always been a son as far as you go back. Yeah. There's, there's an been, impersonal, father son, father son. right, there's an eternal, impersonal principle derived from nature instead of the eternal, unchanging, triune, transcendent God in creation, right, being, as you pointed out, ectypal. We get little hints um, in it, um, but he, we are dependent upon his revelation for 
as much of the truth as we're allowed. Um, no, no, no. Nature is the truth by which you reason upward into the spiritual realm. Hmm. It, assuming the continuum, as a Bible scholar John Oswald points out, is a unifying feature of the myths that on root level, God's nature and man are the same. That is something that unites uh, pagan mythology uh, that the Bible confronts right away in the first verse. Mm. Which is why the Bible, even if the Bible were not true, it's not myth. Mm. But anyway, yeah, uh, that's a hint of an episode coming in the future. We, we interviewed John Oswald on this point. But that's so on eternal progenitorship, he's affirming a natural principle that you never have a son without a father or a father without a son. And mm -hmm. you just take that. Yeah, um, and, and, and run with I it. would encourage readers to consider um, Rodney Turner's essay. Uh, Doctrine he, of the Firstborn or something yes. like this? Yeah, it's somewhere back here. Uh, it's online for free, and he ar in it argues for multiple saviors yep. over different jurisdictions, and he, mm -hmm. he picks up on this progenitorship principle. Um, so it's a it's an yep. extremely blasphemous uh, paper, uh, chapter, arguing that Jesus' preeminence is relative and not absolute. Right, which would have been normal to me when I was in. I mean, it was it was funny before we did this, uh, you were sending little highlights from the paper. I'm like, of course, of course, of course, of course. There was nothing shocking to me. In fact, in the LDS temple, unless they've changed this recently, uh, the Lucifer figure says, I'm only been doing what's been done in other worlds. So there's also, mm -hmm. just as there's... A principle of Satan. Yeah, that's also equivalent, yeah. uh, which leads, well, if the saviorhood is a role filled by mm -hmm. multiple people, then perhaps um, the Lucifer or the adversary in each world is a role. So when some Latter-day Saints hear the question, has God always been God? They might affirm it on account of the principle or title or position of God always having been filled in some sense somewhere. Sure. Not that our particular God has been in that position. Exactly. Because the title is yeah. an eternal title. So, the, yeah, that's why you have to see by that, do you mean an impersonal pattern yeah. Or do you mean the person, the individual intelligence that you're calling Heavenly Father currently? And this, this, is, this is really interesting because Orson Pratt is like, oh, maybe when we worship God, we're not worshiping a particular person. Right. Maybe we're worshiping the sum total of all divine attributes possessed by all the gods. Or, and Brigham Young's like, uh-oh, this is getting weird too. Like, you know, different kind of weird, but uh, <laughs> and Br Brigham Young's, it rejects that, and it's like, no, we're worshiping God as the person. Um, whew. Okay, so, I mean, all of this for me um, is a setup for contrasting the biblical view with the Mormon view. And I, I take there to be four different ways that Christians speak of God as Father. So we've been talking about the first, and it's that God the Father, the person of the Father, has eternally begotten the Son, in contrast to the early Mormon teaching that the Son became the Son via taking on flesh. Um, and then you can further make that contrast with this eternal progenitorship principle of either an infinite regress or something, you know, there's different variations. But um, so, I mean, they reject the eternal generation of the Son. They re reject that there's this fruitful generation happening within the very being of God eternally from all eternity. So they reject that the Father has always been fathering the Son in such a manner. Um, that's, that's huge. It's not, that, it's not merely, is there one God? That's e equally important. It's not merely, is the Son uh, the same being as the Father? That's equally important. You have to understand, the, the central question of Nicaea is not whether Jesus is God. No. The central question of Nicaea is, in light of the Father eternally begetting the Son, does that make him a different God? Does that make him of the same being, same mm -hmm. substance? And can we affirm that the Son is not inferior to the Father in light of the Son being eternally begotten of the Father? Mm -hmm. So that's the first of four ways. And that, that sets up for me explaining to Latter-day Saints and Christians, because this is totally helping Christians think through theology, that God is Father as Father of the 
only begotten Son eternally, that God, as Father, Son, and Spirit, is the Father of all creation. And I'm using that term to mean that He created everything. That's all I mean by that. I'm not trying to confuse the persons of the Trinity. I'm just saying that, like, that as Creator, He's the Father over all creation. Mm -hmm. Bible, the Bible says, from Him and through Him and to Him are all things. Ex nihilo. From Himself, um, depending on none other, not dependent or needy on some sort of external conditioning mm -hmm. or external power. That's ultimately what ex nihilo comes down to is, is God needy and dependent on yeah. something outside of himself to create. Exactly. That's why uh, I even like the distinction out of nothing and into nothing. Mm. There's nothing that exists alongside God that he's accountable to in any way. Mm. Yeah, and that's a mysterious doctrine because he, he doesn't change or add. Nope. Um, he, 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 he maintains his immutability. Exactly. James 1, is it 16, 17? What's it it even uses fathering language. Oh, the yeah, father of lights. Yes. Oh, yeah. But it even the uses... Oh, yes, that's right. It uses creation, that father, language. Oh it came goodness. to my mind last night because it's perfect because oh. he, he says, yet there's no shadow of turning. So even in the act of creating, God doesn't change. The father of lights with whom there is no shadow or variation of change. It's beautiful. And I think in that text, it's like every good and perfect gift comes from yep. the Father, this God, the Father yep. of light. So there's something about the immutable, unchanging nature of God that makes him best fit. Like the, he's the best gift giver because he doesn't change. Yep. Because he's the immutable, impassable, unchangeable God, he can give the best gifts. So, so you said there's four aspects of, of biblical fatherhood. Of God. of God. One being eternal generation. That's a good summary of the point. Yeah. Two, we're on general creation. The father of lights. Father yeah. of lights. Yeah. What's point three? Um, well, can we rewind a little bit? Please. In Mormonism, God did not create matter. He didn't create the fundamental potential. That I think that's helpful. It's not merely that he didn't create matter, ultimately. He didn't give matter its original potential. No, no way. So he was only able to really activate or actualize the potential that was fundamentally already there. Mm -hmm. and Eternally. I, I hope this makes people understand that, that matter, there's a glory to matter. Um, matter is not static, inert, uh, nothingness. It's, it's, it's something that has potential. And... Uh, there's a glory to that. So if we say that God did not give matter its original potential, then there's a glory that doesn't come from God. In Mormonism, he didn't create matter. He can't create or destroy the fundamental stuff of the cosmos. Neither did he author the original uh, eternal laws. Rather, moral, uh, you might include aesthetic, sure. mathematical, um, priesthood uh, laws, there's another set of laws you can think about, but the law conditions of the universe were the system in which God found himself. Um, it, God did not author the system. He's in the system. So there's eternal law, there's matter, and then there's persons. Now, unless you take the young view, which itself kind of has its own creation ex nihilo aspect. Uh, if you take a the weakness to it. If you have an Osler, Roberts... Um, well, I think Pratt should be included in the mm -hmm. um, the young view here in this aspect. But if you have a if you have a Pratt, sorry, if you have a Roberts or a um, Osler view, the individual is uncreated. Nor God. I mean, Joseph Smith just says this: God does not have the power to create the spirit of man yeah. or, or eternal himself. Mm -hmm. or himself. Yeah. Um, so God didn't create the original self of the individual. He didn't create matter and he didn't he's not his mind is not the source of all good ideas in mormonism now if you ask me that's kind of like the most important stuff of you know the fundamentals of the cosmos people stuff and ideas <laughs> and none of that came from god in the in the mainstream mormon uh framework so uh god as father of all creation really takes a hit in the latter-day saint framework now to the third sense, that God is the God of special creation. This is the sense in which he made male and female in his own image and likeness. Uh, man is the 
apex, the pinnacle, the crown jewel of his creation. Um, uh, we are, and not the angels, and not dolphins, even though intelligent, we are the image of God. Uh, Bavink makes the point that we're not merely image bearers. We are the image of God, but not in an absolute sense, in a finite sense, in an ectypal sense. God is the archetype. We're the ectype. We're the derivative. He's the original. He's the superior original, and we're the inferior and finite ectype. We're downstream. We imitate in, a, in an inferior way what God is. But we have the unique privilege of both representing, imaging him to others and to the rest of creation. And we have the privilege of having the sort of nature that makes us fitting representatives. So God didn't say, be fruitful, multiply, uh, take dominion, you know, represent me over the entire earth. And then we were un incapable of doing that fundamentally. No, he made us capable and fitting to the task. So some people think about the role or the job duty of humanity in Genesis 1 as part of the image. Some people think it's just an immediate entailment or whatever, but at the very least, the substance with which we're made, what we are is that image, and it comes with job uh, 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 roles and, and responsibilities. What I love about Herman Bavink's take on the image of God is that he takes the historic Christian emphasis on the um, immaterial internal self, you know, uh, the, the spiritual capacities, our free will, however you define that. Um, he takes our relationality, our emotions, our spirituality, our ability to have a relationship with God and other people as the image. But Bavink is, is, is uh, he's careful to say that it's not that part of man is in the image of part of God. The whole, if I remember this quote correctly, the whole man is in the image of the whole God. Now, in an ectypal and analogical sense, in an inferior and finite sense, but it's not that part of us is in the image of God, and, or, or, or it's not that part of us image is part of God. It's not like we can divide God up into pieces and say, well, we, we are like this part. This is where like the communicable and incommunicable attribute classification is it's really helpful but it's very limited like you, you have to be careful because the communicable attributes um in a sense they all really are mapping onto incommunicable attributes and all of what we we we're like a reminiscent uh, we're, we're, we resemble god we we image him but in an analogical way right in every respect it's analogical um, there's no one-to-one -one mapping in, in any case. So, the, what, first of all, this is exciting because it includes the body, soul, and spirit. Have you, have you divide that up? It includes the whole man. It includes the body. It, it includes the body. And I think that evangelicals doing dialogue with Mormons might, be, might feel the temptation to withdraw from that and say, well, it's not our body because we don't want to say that God has a body. Well, if you're thinking analogically... You don't have to say that God is an exact replica or exact equivalent to what we are. If our bodies are the immediate instrument of the soul in expressing those internal beauties, capacities, faculties, if God made man, male and female, in his image, uh, we by default ought to assume the body is a part of that. Mm -hmm. uh, we already have precedent in general creation of visible creation um, exhibiting invisible attributes. Uh, that is to say, we, in Romans 1, we can perceive with invisible creation the eternal power and divine nature of God. His, 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 his uh, eternal power and divine nature is perceivable in visible creation. I once read a poem that's like, invisible beauty for visible creatures, in visible beauty, a riddle for you. Uh, um, so we, we all the more as embodied representatives of God, 
body, soul, and spirit, inward and outward, we're imaging God. Now, the, the soul does that in more clear and strong ways than the body does, but the body is a part of that. Uh, so there's something, I think it's Peter, I say his name, Maastricht. He, he talks about how the human body is unique in that we don't crawl or fly. We're not like, we're not like staring at the ground. We're not, we're, we're, we're the only upright cre- creature. And it, it's very fitting because we're the only heavenly minded creature on earth. He might begin that from Dante. Oh, yeah. Uh, that, gazing upward. Yeah, he ends every, all three parts of the Divine Comedy with stars. We, we contemplate the stars, right. we contemplate right. the big things. We're called to have relationship with our Creator. Mm-hmm. And so the body is a fitting. I, I, uh, I see some of this in, Reve- in 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul sees in the very hair uh, a kind of the congruent creational reality. There, there's something like iconic in the way he made the body mm-hmm. to exemplify even the creation order. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something about the glorying of, of what, who you are, even in your gender, that comes out in the way um, your body presents. And Anyway, I, I can't dwell too long on that, but we are in the image and likeness of God analogically, and it's the whole man, not part of man, and it's the whole God that we analogically represent, not part of God. Now, bring that back to the discussion with Mormonism. If you take, especially if you take the Roberts view or the Osler view, especially with those two views, you are not entirely made in the image and likeness of God. It, there's a double whammy here. When you were begotten or made in the image and likeness of God, um, in the Roberts view, you have this intelligence that wasn't made, and it wasn't begotten, and it wasn't fathered into existence, and it wasn't like it wasn't made to image God. It wasn't designed or begotten to be in His likeness. The intelligence, the the innermost original self. It's just a, what philosophers call a brute fact of the universe. You're just there. You're a little I am in the Roberts model. And you are not the, so Paul in Romans, sorry, in Acts 17, Paul, I, I keep forgetting the order. Paul says, we are the image of God. Sorry, he didn't say it. He says, we are the offspring of God. It's either before or after that. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. So in Paul's view, I don't think he's talking about redemptive sonship here. Van Hale gets this wrong. Van Hale tries to give a concession and he's like, well, these passages are referring to redemptive adoptive sonship. And he includes Romans 8, 16 in that. I'm like, thank you, <laughs> thank you. But he includes Acts 17 in that. I'm like, no, 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 no. Acts 17 really is talking about universal sonship. But in Paul's framework, you have in this very same sermon, an independent, sufficient deity who creates heaven and earth without needing anything, who does not dwell in temples built by human hands, who made all of humanity from Adam. We are this God's offspring. In him we live and move and have our being. If the Roberts model holds, I can't say that about the intelligence. The intelligence self doesn't owe its very existence. It doesn't derive its very being from and of God. It doesn't have its being in God. Uh, you're just a self-existent I am. So the, the sense of offspring and fatherhood in Acts 17 is lost. Right. When the fundamental original self is a brute fact, uncreated, unbegotten, unimaged, and unfathered. Yeah. And in, in, in terms of the being point, that applies to all the views would be my understanding. But... Um, because it gets down to spirit element. Too. Exactly. Yeah. Because it, that doesn't exist yeah. by God. So not all of you. Exactly. Yeah. But the offspring point is, if, yeah, like you said, um, even the Brigham view um, would have more offspring to it, but it still wouldn't have that fundamental feature that qualifies the offspring point Paul is making. That all of you yes. and all of your being is in God and right. God. God didn't just create you in time. He upholds you in every moment of time. The same power that he created you with is the same power he preserved you with. Right. And so 
that frames the entire image and likeness category. So what, what do you encounter LDS often arguing on this point of what the image and likeness is? So if you, is? if you follow that train of thought, it's not the innermost being, it, the innermost self that was made in his image. What do, have, what do Latter-day Saints have left, say in the, the, the default Roberts model? All that they have is the sort of the second layer of the Russian doll and the third layer of the Russian doll. So they have a very external view of image. And that's not, it's not an accident that Latter-day Saints focus on the surface or the appearance or the visual of God. He looks like me. See, he has a body. And it's like, it's missing the forest for the trees. It's like, it, what it is, it's a, I call it a superficial view of image and likeness. It's not a substantial view of image and likeness. It makes some of us, it makes some part of us that was an add-on, not in, not in the Roberts model, an initial integral part of the essential self wasn't made in the image of God. It's just an, an, an upgraded, additive, external add-on part is in the image and likeness of God. So they really do focus on the superficiality of it. Whereas Christians have much more to work with. Like, no, the whole man, the whole of the human person is made in the image and likeness of God. And I'm not committed in saying that to, to, to saying that God is exactly like me. He's not, it's, I'm not a copy paste mm -hmm. of God. Um, I am in the image and likeness. I'm an embodied representative of that. And I'd also add that um, Latter-day Saints are really motivated in this train of thought to say, well, at least this makes us of the same species as God. And I, I stop there and I say, well, hold on. In the Osler and the Roberts model, you did not derive your original species from God. Mm -hmm. Your original species isn't from or of God. It's just a brute fact of the universe. Mm -hmm. it, if God never thought about you, never adopted you, you'd still be the species, the, the initial mm -hmm. essence of what you are. That you know, um, I, I have a friend named Craig who likened this to like downloadable game content, where you, this was like unlocks. You can <laughs> unlock like add-ons, but like. Um, the, if this Roberts or Osler view is true, um, I lost my train of thought. You're not completely fathered by God. Um, where was I going with that? So, um, I'm so sorry. Like, like was the image and likeness status associated with a brute fact of nature, in which case it's weird the Bible would speak of it as a unique attribute of humanity at all. Is it with the spirit body, in which case it's not the physical literalness that they often use the passage for? Or is it with the body, in which case it's not you who's made the image and likeness of God, but the body, and it's merely a point about copulation? Um, it makes it feel like my spirit body is made in his image and likeness, and then further, my mortal body is made in his image and likeness but not my original innermost self. Right. And so it's a very superficial and external view of image and likeness. It's not a substantial and whole view of image and likeness. It also doesn't dignify the body because the body is just an, a late add-on. Uh, your body came very late. You spent an infinite amount of time without your body. Whereas in the Christian view, your body was an original integral part of the self. Right. In fact, uh, Genesis 2, carefully, it's first. He breathes life into the body. Into the body already made. Making the, and, and yeah. So it's, I'm not, I'm not yeah. trying to create a dualism. Yeah. I'm saying the emphasis is body first. It's, it's not, yeah. like I said, I'm not making a body spirit dualism. Don't hear me just doing that. Well, your point's but, well taken because Adam, Adam's body was made before the breath of the life, life was given born. to him. Mm -hmm. But subsequent to that in conception, um, the body and the, the soul um, are, is it the word concomitant? It's, it's, uh, so there, there, are, there are two Christian views on this. One is traducianism and what's called soul creationism. In traducianism, the soul is just as much begotten as the body is from earthly parents. More of a Lutheran view. Um, it's probably connected to the view of the Lord's Supper somewhere. <laughs> I, I, I don't, <laughs> I, I, I'm guessing there's a systematic connection there. In soul creationism, which is the view I take, especially after having looked at the doctrine of, of the virgin birth, this is very motivating. Um, 
and, and I share this view with, it's the re predominant view of the reformers and the reformed scholastics. And it's the view that our bodies are begotten by our earthly parents, but simultaneous to that is the creation, the special creation by God of our soul, of our spirit. Um, okay, that's a systematic question you could chase out, but either which way you view uh, that, um, we are ultimately from and of God. Um, but in the Roberts and Osler view, that's just not the case. Um, so you, so when, when Mormons say literal, it ends up being a euphemism for partial and external and superficial and additive. Um, whereas in Christianity, we get something better than a literal father. Our, our literal fathers, to be clear, they're very inferior to God's fatherhood. Like we're, they're very much of a finite pointer to something bigger and better. Yeah. When my father died, I didn't cease to exist. Like my existence was not dependent on my father's life. Hmm. Whereas with God, every moment, breath, heartbeat is dependent upon God upholding hmm. what he created. So, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's almost, um, did, did he drop you off at school? Or <laughs> did he create the school and the roads and your existence and write the storyline? And I mean, this is the gap. I mean, it's a Grand Canyon of difference. Hmm. For those who use, and this is typical, Terrell Givens comes to mind, say, well, Origen believed in the preexistence of the spirit of man. Mm -hmm. Why is that not like any of these Mormon views? In other words, even in our diversity, the condemned diversity in the case of Origen, why is that not make room for Mormonism saying, well, we just relate to? It's to a great question. I'll give a provisional answer because I haven't deep dives enough on origin. So I'll give a provisional answer according to my limited knowledge for further investigation. Um, my understanding is that origin's view is more like the original Mormon view of a conceptual preexistence in the mind of God, not a mind independent preexistence. That would be the key. The key distinction is that origin's not thinking in terms of the preexistence of things that are independent of God's existence yeah. We're, or independent of God's mind. In, in, in the late Mormonism view, we exist independent of the thoughts of God. Uh, in Origen's view, we are entirely dependent on the thoughts of God. So you might have an eternal creation in Origen's view. It's still dependent on God. Uh, you might have a preexistence, but it's still, it's probably something more like, um, I think he's picking up on Platonism maybe, um, but it's it's more of a conceptual or ideal preexistence. Sure. So, um, in, in, to be clear, that view of ideal creation is not the LDS view. It's not what you get in gospel principles. No. It's not what you get in general conference. They've it's rejected not... their own scriptures on this, I, uh, I think. Yeah. Sure. And so even there, it might have been a confused originism. Yeah. Right? Um, but origin still thinks we're created, right? Not just organized. Right. Um, yeah. Okay. So God's not a character in, in the series yeah. that is really important because he's qualitatively further progressed. He's not just a facilitator in the cosmos yeah. um, collaborating with us. Right. He's not just a volunteer in the cosmos who's like activating potential that we already had independent of God. Right, right. That's what I like to point out is even, um, not to derail this, but even Christian heretics are closer often than Mormons. Mormonism. Yeah. Uh, in this sense, uh, like Arius, he still affirms a creator-creation distinction yeah. that Mormonism denies. So it's it's kind of helpful to say that even, it, and you you run into this, because there's Christian diversity, why aren't we included? Hmm. I think it's key to show the map and say, even among the diversity, there mm -hmm. are fundamental differences because one is based on the Bible and one isn't, right? One ran in the other direction. Right. Yeah. So this uh, fourth, what is the fourth? God sense is of... the redemptive father of adopted sons. And I see this as the primary father sonship for, with respect to the saints and the believers motif of the New Testament. John 1 says, to as many as received him, excuse me, to as many as received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Um, paraphrasing a bit. Children not born of the will of man, nor of blood, nor of the flesh, but born of God. So I think of that as like three gavel strikes. Uh, not, nor, nor. Not of blood, not of flesh, not of the will of man. It's not literal. It's not literal. It's not literal. It's born of God. Rebirth, uh, adoption. Uh, I put those two categories, uh, distinct but inseparable. And uh, man, Romans 8, 16. 
the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. Um, in the debate last night, it was super interesting that um, he didn't include Romans 8, 16 in any of his slides that I could tell when that's been one of the primary texts used by his own LDS prophetic tradition to argue for this in the New Testament. It's like, he, it's, I think he might have realized that this was a losing proposition because if you zoom out to Romans 8, 14 and 15, it says, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God, for we have not received the spirit of slavery fear. again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry, Abba, Father, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And it goes on to talk about we were heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. And that distinction is really interesting relative to 8.16 because Latter-day Saints... I think Latter-day Saints, who've thought just a little bit about this, to include the 1916 First Presidency Statement on the Father and the Son, they try to relocate the doctrine of adoption uh, under the Son, and not in any way under the Father, um, so that we become adopted sons and daughters of Jesus Christ through Jesus Christ. Uh, now, there's a partial truth there, but in, eight, six, in Romans 8.16, God really has, it seems, um, all of God in view, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but it has chiefly in view the Father, especially when you take the next verse, uh, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. It's the Father who adopts us, inseparably with the Father, with the Son and the Spirit, but it is the Father who adopts us. We become in Christ. In Christ, united with Christ, Co-heirs with Christ, heirs of God, yep. heirs with co-heirs with Christ. And that's very awkward in Mormonism that we would be literal sons and daughters of God, whatever that means in whatever model. Um, it's very awkward, though, to have God adopting sons that are already his quote-unquote literal sons. So a more sophisticated Latter-day Saint theology says, well, the Father does adopt us because at the Garden, at Eden, we became disinherited sons and daughters. And so we needed to be brought back into the fold through adoption. Now, the awkwardness of that is that the fall is treated as a great blessing. Uh, a blessing. It's an imitable act. It's a holy and righteous the and wise upward. action. It's an Eve opportunity. Did, you know, Paul says, don't imitate Eve, essentially. And Mormonism says, imitate Eve. Please. There's um, even little, I'm, I haven't, I'm not sure if you've seen this. There's a little kid's book, Teaching Little Girls. You can buy a Deseret book, um, at least could. Um, to imitate Eve, because oh, she yeah. she understood the plan sooner than Adam, faster than her husband. We're adopted by God in the Son, and it comes with a package of other benefits of doc, of a salvation salvific benefits: eternal life received as a gift, adoption, union with Christ, uh, the gift of the Holy Ghost, forgiveness, justification, double imputation, counted with the righteousness of Christ, Him uh, counted with the sin of man of his of his people. Um, so to be adopted is like you're brought in, you're given a seat at the table, you're given a seat at the Lord's Supper table with the least sophisticated, most problematic, most sinful believers and the most holy and most trained and most seasoned believers. You're given an equal seat at the table um, before the bread and the, and the wine and you are equal before the Father and the Son. And that, um, I, I hope people understand like, the dignity of being the, the created offspring of the Most High multiplied by the dignity of being adopted by God, the Most High, in the Son is an infinitely better dignity, an infinitely higher dignity than being a literal son or daughter of a, I'm going to be punchy here, a demigod Superman. Now, I mean, you mentioned it at some point. Um, Spencer Kimball actually favorably takes the We are Superman, called to be Superman. Uh, and That's then, what Kimball says. And then President at, of the LDS Church. For at those who don't least know. with respect to yeah. uh, the incarnate son, McConkie applies the demigod category or at least associates the demigod category. Anyway, okay. I'm using the demigod category in a looser sense that it's something other than the archetypal first original most high transcendent God from whom all things come. The one God. 
The archetype, yeah. Yep. So if it's an ectype and you're going to call it a god, then it is conceptually, it is, it is categorically, it's in, in the sense that I'm using it, it's a demigod. So if you're just a literal son or daughter of a god who has a god who has a god who has a god, who's not the ultimate transcendent author of the system, he's just in the system. If, if, if you're just a downstream, ectypal, begotten uh, god and embryo, of another deity who had to become a god, who's not the first, if you could kind of collab, we don't know when the gods began to be. You know, it's like, okay, like, I read DC Comics, Marvel, and I see maybe Superman has a son. Is that cool? Sure. You know, it, it, being the son of a Marvel god character, is there dignity in that? Sure. But, that's nothing. That that's that's boring and inferior compared to being in the image and likeness of the Most High God. Mormons will say often they don't know who the first God was, so they don't have a relationship with the first God. Um, they don't know who He is. They don't have the privilege or dignity of having a personal relationship with the very first God. They might say, "Well, the first God for us, for this generation of the gods, or in for this world, for this world." But like the actual first archetypal most high God, they don't have a relationship with him. Well, I'm in the image and likeness of this first God. I have a relationship with him and he adopted me. There's infinitely more dignity in being a non-exact, analogical, created image bearer in the image and likeness of the most high God adopted through the Son. There's infinite more re relational uh, benefits and dignity and honor and joy to that. I mean, just think about just think about conversations in the in the, in the heavenlies in the Mormon cosmos. Who's your dad? You know, like how many generations ago? Like, you know, how far down the lineage is your dad? Are you, you know, um, Jesus talks about the the you know, but John the Baptist says. He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Mm -hmm. And that's based on the principle of priority. What comes before is supreme, ultimately. Yeah. Jesus says, I'm from above. You are from below. Yeah. <laughs> Distinguishing origin. <laughs> uh, different origin. So No pun intended. That um, supremacy in mind, we get to be adopted by that God. Right. In, in, in terms of relationship with the first God, of course, uh, this is the Pratt-Young debate, right? Um, Pratt would so thinking there was a time when there were no gods. Um, and then the first gods evolved uh, to become the first gods. Of course, Young just adds uh, or, or owns the uh, infinite regress. Yeah. That there, there's, somehow there's a feature in time that is circ circular. Hmm. And there's just always been sons becoming fathers. Sons One eternal fathers. round in that sense. Right. So it's, an, I, I don't know, I think an LDS would say, no, I have a relationship with them. But I, what you mean is, is true. They don't have, it's not the type of relationship you have with your dad or, or something like this. Um, it's the same relationship you have with an ancient ancestor in this world that you don't know anything about, even if you're inheriting traits subconsciously. Yeah. I think the closest thing they have, once again, and this, this is evidence for Orson's, Orson Pratt's position, the closest thing they have to this that they can, um, that, you know, God the Father and his progression tapped into as much as we need to to become where, where he is, become equal in status, is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit's impersonal, right? The, the Holy Spirit, um, yeah, it can be all places at all times. Is that like the... Mediating agent of omnipresence, or sure. I mean, or, I mean, it's talked about in different ways, but this density. this one hasn't died. It, it, Pratt makes this makes the distinction. You see it in a talk like Boyd K. Packer's Light of Christ, where he distinguishes the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. So the person of the Holy Ghost is someone on the path of progression, but the Holy Spirit is the light that lighteth all things, including the mind mm -hmm. of man, things like this. But my point is, it can't be love because it's not personal. So mm -hmm. to the degree that which they have something. Hmm. though still within the system, no creator-creation distinction. So it's not like God, the Holy Spirit. Hmm. But the closest thing they have to it is still not personal. Hmm. It's still not love. It is really interesting It's to still me. not procreative. They're, uh, they're, they mock 
the God of the creeds as abstract and impersonal. Sure. And then yet they arrive at a place in their own theology where the ultimate governing force or the ultimate governing laws of their own system are without body parts or passions. Yep. And in, like you said, impersonal. There's an mm -hmm. impersonal law that is not from any personal ultimate deity mm -hmm. that governs all the deities. Yep. self -existence. So in a sense, the God of Mormonism is an abstract, eternal law idea mm -hmm. um, mediated by the gods, but not really... Um, it's, it's, it's kind of more transcendent than the right. gods themselves. Where, which is why you can see Orson Pratt's argument that the attributes matter more than any mm. particular god that has them at this time. There's a really interesting question with the Pratt discussion where do all the particles in a an exalted deity, do, does, does each particle possess all the attributes of God? And that's a really interesting question for even modern Latter-day Saints. If you're going to divide God up into different parts, let alone finite parts, are you attributing all of the attributes of God to every uh, uh, piece or part of God? This is a, it's, it it's is. A, it, maybe I'm too... Uh, captive of the Robert synthesis, but I would have said, and I don't know if this is what Orson actually said, to be mm. clear, but I would have said every particle has the potential. Mm. Maybe that's how I would have tried to hold it together. But that, once again, whereas redemptive sonship is the triune God who created all things, right? God the Son becoming the Word to save a people in a world He created, time, space He created, right? Story He created. And at the end of the day, um, what I think is so devastating to the Mormon position is they're claiming this Jesus. Hmm. And they're not. They're, they're claiming a word. They're, they're, it's a linguistic trick to say, this Jesus, the Jesus of history, that we believe the second person of the Trinity, um, we claim him. Well, if you claim him, but none of the features of the worldview he affirmed, revealed yeah then how can you say this is the same jesus there he did he play word games with the prophets like we saw last night oh he was just an apostle no, he says god spoke he's he quotes isaiah he quotes the prophets he quotes it's interesting jesus. jesus comes down the sermon on the mount uh matthew 7 and it says the crowd was amazed because he spoke not as the scribes but as he spoke as one who has authority and it ends up being the pharisees who were wrapped up in all these extra traditions that can't speak with authority. And it ends up being Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles who ultimately, according to their own adherents, don't speak with authority. And it's like, well, that's just his speculation. That's just his opinion. He was just an apostle when he said that. Um, also, some of the most important statements Jesus made, um, they're gutted. Jesus says to the Pharisees in the Gospel of Luke, did not he who create, created the, uh, the body also create did he who not create what's on the outside not also create what's on the inside? If you take the Osler or view Robert or Robert's view especially, it's just not true. For Jesus, it's ethically significant that he created both the outward and the inward part. For Jesus, uh, he thinks you're a fool if you don't think that God created the innermost part of who you are. But in the Robert's dominant Latter-day Saint default view, the innermost part of man was not created by right. God. Mm -mm. At all. Nor could be. Yeah. What do you say to someone who says, well, in John 10, Jesus says we're gods? You know, it's interesting. The debate partner last night said the we. I think he said the we. I, th uh, I think I corrected him. I, Let's just assume an LDS says the we. Yeah, forgive me if I'm misstating that. Um, yeah. I don't know if you I apologize did, but, if but I, I have heard yeah. this from LDS. Yeah, it, it, it's not a we, it's a you. Is it not written, ye are, ye are gods? Um, and that's quoting Psalm 82. And it doesn't look like, even by Latter-day Saint standards, the gods of Psalm 82, whether you take them as human judges or heavenly beings or a hybrid model where you have human judges that are participating in a spiritual realm behind which are heavenly beings. Whatever model you take of Psalm 82, the gods of Psalm 82 are condemned to die like men because of their abuse, their unrighteousness, their wickedness, uh, their mistreatment. They're not good candidates by Latter-day Saint standards for exaltation. So I like to say, do you want your kids to be like the gods of Psalm 82? 
when Jesus said, ye are gods in, in John 10, it doesn't sound like it's a compliment. Uh, and nor does the audience by Latter-day Saint standards seem to be good candidates for exaltation. It's, a, it's really not about your potential to become worshipped someday or your God and embryo potential to be an omnipotent being someday. I mean, sure, like we have the potential to be glorified, resurrected beings who in some sense see God. Um, that's incredible. That's beyond what I can wrap my head around. Although I maintain the creature-creator distinction there. Um, but the point of John 10 is Jesus calling attention to his own unique status. He is the one who presided over, uh, who judged over, he was the supreme singular God of Psalm 82. He was different from the gods. Uh, the, these gods are created, they're inferior, they're judgeable, they're wicked. Uh, but God, Jesus, stands in that council as the final judge. And in John 10, it's all the more appropriate. If, if y'all are called gods, if the audience of of the, the gods of Psalm 82 are called gods. It's all the more appropriate that Jesus would be called the Son of God, one with the Father, equal with the Father. Right. If you've seen me, that's an interesting verse. John, I think it's in John 10, John 10 or 11. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. So Latter day Saints are like, ha, he's got a body. I don't think they're listening. In John, uh, you have the work of the Father and the Son. The son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. That's another verse. John five nineteen. They 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 accidentally requote it. They they change the wording that the son is doing what the father did. Uh, they sort of like watching a VHS tape of cosmic history. Um, no, it's that the father is working now. Even earlier in the same chapter, the father is working now, and I am working. It's that the the father and the son are inseparably working. The son is doing what the father is doing within him. The son is only speaking the words that the Father gives him to do. The Son is able to do miracles but the, because the Father is working miracles within him. It's a substantial uh, seeing. There's something there that's substantial to see. Uh, Jesus even says elsewhere, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall, they shall see God. We're not talking about eyelashes. We're talking about attributes. We're talking about the, the Word and the glory and the attributes um, the character, the nature. This isn't talking about the skin of Jesus. This is talking about the word and work and nature uh, of, of, of Jesus um, in relationship with the Father. There's something more, my point is more, it's modest. There's just something substantial there. Stop thinking about this as merely superficial. In, in John, um, Jesus is careful to distinguish Father and Son, and yet, also, make sure we see there's only one God. It's not it, it's not violating a Jewish context, right? It's one work, right? Right. So, what if um, someone comes and and says, "Well, there's evidence of Heavenly Mother. I've read Margaret Barker." What do you say to that? Well, I mean, if you're running in this sort of deconstruction path. Um, then our discussion is going to be shaped differently. I think that's where I want to put some boundaries up and say, look, if you want to be like Daniel McClellan, if you want to be like, um, is it, uh, forgive me, the, I forget some of the names here, but in the LDS community that went in the McClellan direction, if you want to deconstruct your Latter-day Saint theology and then go in that higher criticism uh, path, then let's talk like, I'm a born-again Christian, and you're essentially uh, a secular, progressive adherent of higher criticism. Um, there's something difficult here, though. If you're claiming to be loyal to the Latter-day Saint tradition, then, I mean, especially if, if I'm having more of a public discussion with you, I have a higher expectation than what you say. I like to say, if you can't speak for your church, you should at least be able to speak with your church. So what you say should at least have some calibration and triangulation with your own prophetic tradition, your own leadership. Uh, so I'll ask things like, have your leaders endorsed that? Have your leaders endorsed that Asherah is sort of the echo of Heavenly Mother? Has, does the Old Testament say 
anything positive about Ashra? Are, are you willing to stake your eternity on this? Um, I, I mean, isn't this a little scary that you've, you've summoned John 10 in Psalm 82 and you've spoken positive? Like, I mean, you want to go, like, you want your kids to be like the gods of Psalm 82. It's like, you're, Jesus talked about a, a, an ironic, ironic, not ironic, but ironic judgment where the Pharisees who were going to murder Jesus were going to end up being like the very people they said they were not like. And there's like this ironic providential justice where you fall flat, you you end up being the thing you said you never were. There's an ironic, there's an irony to Mormonism claiming to be Christian, claiming not to be polytheistic. Russell Moore in his better days once said that Mormonism is a modern Canaanite fertility cult. So it, I mean, it, you you really, it, it's kind of like um, people saying, I'm a Christian and I affirm same-sex marriage and uh, sexual activity between two men or two women, and they're, they're, they end up endorsing the very things the conquest brought about. Um, they, and it's like, well, you're now, as a Latter-day Saint with Asherah, you're endorsing the very thing that the, that the exile was brought forth over. You're doing the very thing, you're participating in the very idolatry that you've assured Christians that you weren't participating in. You've, you've given us these credentials that you're Christian just like us, and now you're best representatives. H how embarrassing is it, by the way, for like a debate partner to put up these breasted images of Asherah, you know, drawing some sort of positive connection to Heavenly Mother between Heavenly Mother and Asherah? It, I mean, I might say it this way. The punishment for idolatry is idolatry. The punishment for following Joseph Smith is following Joseph Smith. There's a kind of shame that comes with the unfolding of one's idolatry. And when somebody is starting to endorse Asherah, it's kind of like, whew, like that's, uh, that is itself a judgment. I will say there is one consistency in doing so in the context of also saying, I don't care if he was an apostle, referring to Orson Pratt. Orson Pratt this is not some buddy yeah. nobody remembers. Um, is dismissing the very authority you claim. Um, it, he doesn't care about Isaiah and Jeremiah. Hmm. And, and like you said, there are reference to Asherah negative. He's like, oh, that's the Deuteronomist. Well, okay, there is one point of consistency for your worldview. You don't care what Orson Pratt said. You don't care what Isaiah said. You don't care what Brigham Young said. You don't care what Jeremiah said. But you do you care, care what Blake Osler but, says. And what Margaret Barker, who's yeah. not a Mormon, has written about. Yeah. And she does not believe the ancient temple looked like the Mormon temple, for the record, in her own words. So this is where we're left, is atomized individuals creating Mormonism in their image, determining the line for everyone else. I don't think Latter-day Saint um, junior apologists understand the path they're about to go down. I don't think common Latter-day Saints understand just how different and distant their own apologetics community is they they've they've endorsed this i, I don't i don't think the common latter-day saint is necessarily comfortable with asherah being on their flag or their banner uh, i mean i <laughs> I, I guess what i'm saying is like latter-day saint apologists are difficult to interact with for me because the more trained and read they are the less representative they are of the Latter-day Saint tradition. They quickly swerve off into a direction where they they, they no longer fit the mainstream. Sure. The restoration of all things was contingent upon Margaret Barker, apparently, uh, and not any of their authority that they claim were apart from the true church for not being under. Hmm. It's... Um, I For the listener who doesn't quite see this yet. The issue of authority will dominate, whether explicitly or implicitly, every conversation we have. And at the risk of over-repeating the point, it is an ironic place to be in when they claim what we need is more than a Bible. We need living prophets and apostles who receive God's word to them now to deliver them to them, um, depending on who you're talking to, in general conference at least, mm -hmm. at least general conference. And yet we quote them more than they do. We're begging them to read their own, gu their own guys. Yeah. 
Like, please read your own prophets and apostles. Please. Will the living ones have more authority than the dead ones? Will the dead ones still have more authority than your TikTokers and your YouTubers sure. and your BYU religion department? So why why is there not... It, it's interesting. It's I probably should uh, round the third base here and head home, but it's interesting to me that Latter-day Saints talk a big game about prophets and apostles and they're kind of gun shy about quoting prophets and apostles with the outside world. Uh, they, they don't seem very proud. Latter-day Saint apologists. I, I remember like going to the symposiums for the Society for Mormon Philosophy and Theology. And it was like, I remember this CES guy getting up and giving a talk and he was just very not like the others. And he was like quoting Latter-day Saint prophets and apostles to argue for some position on premortality. And there was that kind of scoffing attitude um, among the apologists and philosophers. Like they, they, he was, he was like, um, just he wasn't taken seriously. It was like, oh, that's cute, <laughs> you know. It's like, uh, it's really interesting to me that our, we as critics, evangelical critics, are quoting Latter Day Saint prophets and apostles more often than they are. To your point, we, we're taking them more seriously than they do. It shows me that I don't think you actually believe these guys are to be feared. And by feared, I mean a positive fear. In the Deuteronomy test for a false prophet, if they give a false prophecy or they lead you after false gods, you're, you're no longer to fear them. And, the, and it's predicated on the idea that a true prophet is in some great sense to be feared. And I don't think Latter-day Saints fear their prophets and apostles. No, and... Uh, to your point, if they if apostles have spoken on an Old Testament text, they're right from a Christian perspective. I think a faithful Christian perspective, I should say. Right. In Colossians, when Paul uh, explains Genesis 1, I don't debate with him. It, um, I don't lean into John Walton. I don't lean into Michael Heiser. I lean into the Apostle Paul's sacred interpretation of Genesis 1. The New Testament unpacks the Old. The Sermon on the Mount wasn't correcting the Ten Commandments. No. It was unpacking, what unfolding what was contained in the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Did did Jesus um, wrongly read the Old Testament or go in spite of the Old Testament? We would say no. Apolo the, LDS, the LDS apologists are saying yes. They're taking a very thoroughly cynical approach to the Bible. Yeah. So in closing, last question. The one shot... And we keep referring to it, even though I'm trying to make it this, you know, not necessarily dependent upon the debate. If you didn't watch or listen to it, we'll put a link to it in the show notes for those who are interested. But um, I wanted to make this so you could listen to it without even having heard it. But one thing that you were accused of is not taking the Bible seriously. And I wanted to give you the floor and do you and, and um, by implication, do Christians take the Bible seriously or is it actually... Mormon apologists are taking it more seriously than we are. Well, the context for that remark from my debate opponent was: is it the last, the, the end of part of Genesis, the end of part of Genesis two, where Moses says, "Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and so forth." And the, my debate partner, my debate partner, was saying um, that that entailed preexistence. That's sort of like, it's predicated on um, the leaving of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother. And I'm like, okay, I haven't heard any Latter-day Saint ever interpret it that way. And um, as someone who's sort of not speaking to me as a mere individual, but someone who's at least implicitly, even as a non-official representative, but they're implicitly, hopefully trying to represent the Latter-day Saint tradition. Um, so it, 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 I just asked, like, well, have your own prophets and apostles interpreted it that way? Part of me taking the Bible seriously is taking the sum total evidence into consideration. What do prophets say about prophets? What does Scripture say about Scripture? So I, I want to zoom out. and t like The context of Scripture isn't merely the, the paragraph it's in or the book it's in. The context of Scripture is both that and the larger book, and the canon, um, and the ultimate audience of Scripture 
are believers on the other side of the cross, indwelled by the Holy Spirit, with the clarity of the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. Anyway, uh, where am I going with that? So yeah, I really care about the original intent of Scripture. Um, but part of reverencing Scripture is not getting too excited about idiosyncratic, innovative takes on Scripture. Like if somebody has, is reading a particular passage with a really interesting, new and novel, interesting take for the very first time, because I want to take Scripture so seriously, I want to slow down and say, am I, am I being uh, too clever? Right? Am, I, am, I, am I being too proud about my unique ability to interpret it in a way that no one else ever has? So part of taking Scripture seriously is slowing down and, and reading it in community with other believers who are carefully reflecting on Scripture uh, to include the gifts of the common man and the gift of the scholars and the gift of the translators and the historians. So I hope that answers the, like the spirit of it. In the context of LDS evangelical dialogue, um, I, just, I want my Latter-day Saint dialogue partners to at least come to the table with an awareness of what their own prophets and apostles have said about said scripture, you know? So yeah, yeah, absolutely. The Bible has final uh, authority. There's something special about inspired verbal revelation from God. Um, I, well, maybe we can end with this. A lot of Mormon apologists today want to debate the topic of sola scriptura. And I'm not convinced that's a good topic to camp on because it's kind of a downstream issue. It's kind of an intramural debate um, between people who already believe in a transcendent God. And here's what I mean. It's, I would argue that the Latter-day Saint framework holds to a, uh, a more extreme form of closed canon than we do. It's that there are no, especially as understood through Mormon apologists, there are no infallible pages in their book. So if the canon is, is, is defined by infallible verbal revelation inspired by God, uh, their canon never opened to begin with. It's always been closed. It's a book cover without any pages. So they have a closed canon uh, in a more extreme form of it. The ontology of Scripture, the very nature of Scripture, is a topic that's downstream from one's view of the nature of God. Because I have a transcendent God, He can create out of nothing. He can send His Son to become incarnate. And He can, uh, superintending the events of history, ensuring that which comes to pass to ensure the, the product of Scripture, He can superintend the dual authorship of Scripture so that what is inspired is infallible. It is the very Word of God. It shares features with the very nature of God. It is the Word of God and the Word of man simultaneously. If you have a Mormon view of God, you don't have a transcendent, truly transcendent God. And if you don't have a truly transcendent God, he can't superintend the dual authorship of inspired verbal revelation. So you already have this more fundamental problem in Mormonism where you can't have inspired scripture like Christianity has held throughout the centuries. They have a God problem before they have a scripture problem, but they have a scripture problem because they have a God problem. I am more, this is, this is really cool. Because scripture has one single divine mind that is coherent, and superintending the, the harmony and consistency of the whole canon. Because I have a transcendent God, I, I am called to care more about the context of Scripture than any other book in all of creation. The con context matters more in Scripture than any other book in history because God preserves the uh, relevance of the broader context of the entire canon. So I have more to do. I have more work to do. I have more zoom out, zoom in, boomerang out, boomerang back in. Work to do in interpreting Scripture. So I'm called to take it way more seriously. Latter-day Saints, I think, that take a non-transcendent view of God 
they quickly come to a view of the fallibility of Scripture, and they quickly come to a place where they can't take it as seriously as Christians do because it's been short-circuited by their view of who God is. Unless they can use it. Unless they can use it for, like, I mean, like, it, it's useful for the moment. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly it. And rather than uh, trembling before the word of the holy God, and um, just as a litmus test, too, I find great comfort that even if we don't agree on every particular of ecclesiology and sacramentology, you open up Augustine's Confessions. Uh, it was claimed last night, Augustine taught we can become gods. No, read Augustine. I, I if there was a Q&A, I would have asked him, can you even name a book by Augustine, let alone have you read one? He's, he quoted Athanasius as teaching we can become oh gods. Goodness. I'm sure Athanasius used those words, but if you just read one chapter of any book by an Athanasius, <laughs> you oh, he's on a different conceptual plane than we are. Uh, he yeah. doesn't, I don't think that word means what you think it means. Absolutely, <laughs> and, and the context should determine, determine that. But I find great comfort that Augustine read the scriptures in translation the way I am. You read Confessions, it's the same God. Hmm. It's the same view of God. It's the same view of creation. It's the same view of man, right? And um, contrary to dismissing all Christians that came before, um, we can see among the diversity a unity. And I think the question for LDS going forward will be they, they seem at a breaking point hmm. when they start dismissing the very the only unity they have. Um, if it's not King Follett, if it's not the Lorenzo Snow couplet, what unity do they even have? It's just going to be only diversity. And I think that's a challenge to them, but ultimately, um, I think... Uh, I've heard that Eddie Saints say, well, our prophets are very fallible, but that's an asset, not a liability. It's a feature, not a bug, because God is teaching us and testing us through the fallibility and the testing of our often uh, uh, errant prophets. So I'm like, okay, if you think that, you're, that the fallibility and errancy of your own prophets is a feature, not a bug, uh, an asset, not a liability, then why are you so gun-shy about telling the story of the historical development of LDS theology? Why? I mean, I was, I was trying so hard to get my Latter-day Saint conversation partners to just look at what their own prophets say. And there was a kind of hand-waving, like, no, <laughs> it doesn't matter. And it's like, you know, even if you're, even if you're taking a kind of Protestant liberal view of Scripture where it's full of errors, at least look at what your prophets say. At least don't look the other way. At least take seriously the historic. This is why I love the. Um, this is my doctrine by Charles Harrell. Uh, there's there's a few uh, works in Latter Day Saint scholarship that are really well at. They do really well at historical LDS theology. There's not a lot though, and I'd love to see more of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I will say that if they're going to dismiss Brigham Young in the 19th century, I'm not sure what Ashra dolls, you know, 3,000 years ago or 2,500 years ago have to do with anything. Mm. If they can just so quickly dismiss a Talmadge, dismiss a Kimball, dismiss a Boyd K. Packer, then I'm not sure what we're doing digging in the ground at all. Mm. Um, but maybe Deseret Book should start selling Ashra poles. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> of that, of that unsolicited imagine, like, advice, like a, like a first vision, like figurine <laughs> next to an Asherah figurine, next oh to the gosh. bust of Brigham Young. Uh, it seems fitting. Oh, it's, so. a, it's exhausting. But uh, thanks for doing the. Uh, I don't know if it was two oh, or three thank hours, you. Thank no, you. it was an honor having you, and uh, thank you so much, listener, for for listening. We will uh, see you next time. God bless.